Starfleet Underground. Every week, we'll take a look at the latest Star Trek news and then check out a current or classic episode of Star Trek. Buckle your safety belts. We're catching a gravitational wave and floating on top of the bridge. Saru comes back, and you can call him Mr. The computer changes its name. Gray eyes a new body. Adira makes waves. Tilly is totally stamitzing. Stamets remotes in. Burnham makes a private call. And Book needs to fly. supposed to have turkey dinner for the crew it's supposed to be a dead turkey where did you get a live turkey dot <laughs> where? i'll have to deal with you when the when we're, we're finished with the podcast but thank you um dot 007 uh, uh chief yeah uh, 007's behavior has gotten better but um he still does a lot of weird eccentric stuff i don't know how he got livestock aboard the ship That's i really don't very either. confusing I mean, no. I thought we were having Tribble for Thanksgiving. Yeah, I go out into the to a corridor, and all I hear is like, bow, 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 coming down, up and down. The, it's like, dude, replicate. We didn't want Heather in the kitchen. That's so, your butt cheeks flapping when you don't have your shorts on. Oh, please. <laughs> that's, that's your danglies when you get up from the chair. I tried going in the kitchen, but they kicked me out and said, yeah. no, we want the food to taste good this year. Yeah, that was under my orders. I'm sorry. Oh, oh damn. Yeah, because I was going to have the dots cooked because Chief has been reprogramming them with um, number one. They've been watching a lot of old Martha Stewart. Yes. So I was really, really hoping that they would do it. And one of them, I think, I don't know who did it. I think it's Patrick that did it. Had a little bit of the Swedish chef in it because he's like. (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah, but other than that, it was still pretty good. Holy crap, I forgot the light was on. Okay, first off, this is going to be after the holiday podcast if you're here in the States. So we hope you had a happy Thanksgiving from the entire crew. We want to make sure that you had an enjoyable holiday. And if it wasn't enjoyable, happy um, it, Thanksgiving. Will, it will be once you listen to us. <laughs> so eh. we're here with the full crew compliment today. My name is Nathan and I'm captain of this outstandingly crewed vessel. We have in our science department. Hi, I'm Heather Ferris. I'm the science officer, and I was designated to the kids' table. You wouldn't even let me sit at the normal table. I had to go, like, be the babysitter for all the kids. Do we have kids on this ship? We have a couple. Luckily, it wasn't a big kids' table, but still. No, because every time you wanted to warm stuff up, you take out this lighter and look at me go, can I? It's like, no. (laughs) Well, you wouldn't let me use the the science burner. I thought that would be a good way to heat it up. So I figured the lighter was a good plan B. No, that scared the hell out of me when you came up with the Bunsen burner and just started (laughs) setting it up on the kid's table. It's like, like, no, we're not going to have need another Timmy. (laughs) So, no. Speaking of wonderful science experiments, it actually went right we have our number one fuck you <laughs> hey i said you went right i could have took that the Put bad on. way <laughs> i'm patrick i'm number one i'm also the computer guy and the foreign species liaison and i am not a science experiment yeah but you went right that's what i was saying i could have gone left you well, don't know that's true and of course the guy who makes us go <laughs> or, or i think the best engineer in the entire lead. fleet is chief <laughs> morning afternoon after post thanksgiving day flashing pulsars and all oh wait that was last week hi everyone i'm rocky i'm the engineer of the show in the ship and hey guys i got my booster Woo-hoo. i Woo-hoo. got subspace in all the channels now yeah i got a new subspace amplifier installed i get everything including the ferengi channels that are pay-per-view <laughs> all of the ferengi channels are pay-per-view Ooh, that's gross i noticed that i don't even want to think about that that's <laughs> ooh. Mookie naked? No, no, come on. Tonight on how to give new good umats. <laughs> okay. Um, umats after everybody. dark, a whole nother program you didn't want to know about. <laughs> That's, yeah, we did not want to see that. First off, let me go ahead and talk about if we had any corrections, do we? Let me check subspace here. Da, 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 da. Nope, I don't see anything. It looks like we're good. And today's show is brought to you by... Patreon users and Section 31. What this show is not brought to you by is children. Get the fuck out. If you're a child, do not listen to us. Leave the room. Do not collect go. 
take up your toy, your binky, and your blanket and leave. Don't listen. This is not for you. Unless, of course, you're the children of this ship, because the children of this ship, they know all the swear words. They know all the sexual terms. They know everything that they shouldn't. <laughs> they are very enlightened children on this ship. Or corrupted, yeah. depending. <laughs> enlightened, corrupted, <laughs> yeah. educated. Calling Starfleet's uh, Child Protective Services. <laughs> yeah, they're they're pretty evil. They're called Dot 007, a foreskin head. I was like, what the hell is that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's so gross. I, I I agree. So it was pretty bad. We're going to go ahead and jump this part over right over to the news section. And I know you've been really, really chomping at the bit for this morning's news, Heather. So what do you got? Hi, Captain. So I am really excited to announce that Paramount listened to everybody's bitches and pleas and groans and yelling and everything like that. And they decided to reverse their policy. And now the international market will have Discovery available to them on November 26th. So by the time Woo-hoo! you hear this podcast, you should be able to watch it right now. I'm so excited. <laughs> nice. So nice. They, they released a statement on Twitter and they said, we heard you. Star Trek Discovery now premieres internationally this Friday. And they have a whole message and everything about it. And they said... Unfortunately, not all international fans will be able to catch the series. The series will still remain on Paramount Plus and will be available November 26 in European countries and South American markets, including Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Finland, Guatemala, Norway, Sweden, and Venezuela, where the episodes will air e- weekly. But for fans who live in Australia, France, Germany, Italy, Russia, Spain, South Korea, Switzerland, and the UK, they need to see it on Pluto TV, which is owned by Viacom CBS. And they will be airing new episodes every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday starting November 26. But unfortunately, that means Asia is not going to get it. Anyone in Asia will have to wait until 2022 before they can watch Discovery. The one country I'm not worried about being able to see it when it comes out is Asia. Is because they all will find a way. Uh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Well, they yeah. always find You know a way. how, uh, this is what I've heard. I, I haven't witnessed this firsthand, but this is what I heard is you can go to any like restaurant or whatever and like all sports bars of today, they've got the big screens up everywhere, except they're running first run stuff on those big screens. Oh. Yeah. They, oh. they, they are the ones that really showed the world how to use a VPN correctly. Yeah. (laughs) Because of the censorship that's in Asia. Yep. There's a reason when back in the day you'd buy one of those hacked uh, DVD players and you know where it came from. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't next door. That's for sure. Yeah. They, they will find a way. And for those of you that don't know what Pluto TV, Pluto TV is free. So that's a good thing to have. It allows a lot of old shows as well as some new ones in other markets. So you can get reruns of like Adam's Family, The Monsters, Carol Burnett Show, Magnum P.I., Perry Mason, all kinds of stuff. So it's actually very entertaining. If you happen to have one of these newer smart, you know, quote unquote, smart TVs, it's it's actually worth exploring all of the uh the features on there because you can get a lot of free programming that you don't get normally on your regular cable provider. So it's kind of interesting to explore those. It is really awesome. Speaking of awesome, since he's in a little bit of a tood, but he is awesome. What do you got for news for us there, number one? Well, Michelle Hurd, whom you may know as Rafi from uh, Star Trek Picard, has commented on how geeked out she was that John Delancey and Whoopi Goldberg were a part of season two. She said that working with uh, Whoopi and Delancey is the same as working with Sir Patrick Stewart. I pinch myself. I'm a fan, too. I literally pinch myself when on set and, and I get to work with these iconic creatures. Then she said about Whoopi, she's like, I've got to say, Whoopi's the bomb. She is so cool. She's just cool. She's just Whoopi. That's all you can say. Yeah, she is. She really is. So um, Guinan will be back in season two of Picard. Woo, so yeah. that's, I'm looking forward to that. That's going to be really interesting. I wonder about the adversarial relationship between Q and, and Guinan, how that's going to play out. I really hope they do something with that. Uh, so do I. It's about time that we find out more. Mm-hmm. Uh, Whoopi always stated that she, in her head canon, that she's actually um, Patrick Stewart's great, 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 great grandmother. Nice. Picard's great, great, great grandmother. So I'm curious if they're going to pick that thread and pull it. So we'll see. <laughs> 
Chief, what do you have? The news I'm looking at, well, the 25th anniversary of First Contact happened. It just happened. I'm like, wait, 25 years? It's, that can't be right. But no, that's it what it, apparently it is correct. Uh, no, I don't they, understand they, that either. Wow. Lies. Yeah. <laughs> no um, way. But they had some really cool interviews up on trekmovie.com. In fact, they actually have a lot of the original press junket unedited on the, on, on the website. This is what I'm, I haven't actually had a chance to watch it all, but they say it's unedited. I don't know if it is or not, but just to see all these actors after just getting that sucker done and getting it out, they must, I mean, just the thumbnails, look at the thumbnails and they're so smiley happy about it. I think that's amazing. And, uh, and also in the article, they were talking with Ron Moore about uh, in, in today's time, they were talking to him about how, well, the, there was a rumor that Tom Hanks was going to be playing the role of Zephyr Cochran. And he's like, no, that was never really on the table. So you've heard that yeah. rumor before. I've heard that rumor before. Yeah, so did I. I, I, I don't know. I, I, I think I, I bet it just never was on the table to the guy who was writing the thing. Uh, but you never know. Um, and, uh, and it was also interesting to hear that uh, Patrick Stewart actually had some scenes written because they weren't liking some of the ones that Ronald Moore came up with. And they actually had somebody go write them and they came back and they were even worse. In fact, they were thrown out. So Ron Moore is oh still, still the writer. <laughs> it's just, I thought that was uh, fascinating and that they had to work together with Patrick Stewart after that fact. And uh, it was still, there wasn't, it, it says awkward. there's tension, but it wasn't it's, that much tension. It's nice to see Patrick Stewart is so vested in his character that he's taken an interest. Some actors were like, yeah, whatever, just put it on paper. I'll do it. But he's really protective of, of the character. And that's that as a fan that makes me happy. Oh yeah. That's really cool stuff. Although yeah. I can imagine the, uh, the next convention we go to that Patrick happens to show up and not Patrick, but Patrick Stewart, Sir Patrick shows up. I, I'm sure that one kid's going to come out there with his questions and his tie and ask about the controversy that at one point, you know, the scripts were rewritten and it's like, yeah, yeah. And then he'll look at him and go, the line's just drawn here. <laughs> you will go no further with that question. I mean, I mean you get that scene and the, the way you put that scene together. I just, I, I, you cannot go wrong with that. That no. was such great stuff. First Contact, of course, if you haven't had a chance to see it, one of the best Star Trek movies ever made. You know, one of the things I came across this, this last weekend, which surprised me because I didn't know he directed it. It's still in the Star Trek vein, though. It was on Nickelodeon movie as I was kind of surfing through it. A show called Clock Stoppers, a movie called Clock Stoppers. You ever heard of that? Mm -hmm. I've seen that back yeah. in the day when uh, I think they were still handing out DVD pressers and somebody. Yeah, well, well the Clock Stoppers is about this kid that finds a watch that stops time and how this government agency is after him and him and his girlfriend. And then they use the watch to their advantage, trying to stay ahead of these bad guys who want the watch. Oh, I thought you were going to say <laughs> No. They use the watch to stop time and have sex, and then they continue. Oh, Heather watched the wrong movie again. No, yeah. no, no. Clock that was, with an that L. That was you I, watching cock stoppers. I need to so. stop, like, hanging out at Pornhub. Yeah, but that that actually is a theme. Um, if you look at it, there's a lot of porn. A there's a, yeah, there's a lot of porn out there where you put down freeze time porn, and there's tons <laughs> of it. Wow. Tons of it. Well, Star but, Trek Insurrection was one of those. And you know this how? How? Because I was searching for clock stoppers and forgot the and L. So. The, the name, the name Star, Star Trek is Erection? What? It was misspelled. It was misspelled. So it was no, for my age, is Star Trek the last erection. So, um, however, that being said, the reason why I was tying all this in together is because Jonathan Frakes directed it. The actual the movie, not not the, the not movie. the porn version. No, the movie. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, he the actually directed the clock stoppers. The, the <laughs> clock the stopper. <laughs> the clock with stopper. an L. Oh, the with clocks. an L. It, it's a fun movie. So it's the one you can sit with the kids and everything. There's no, they, they really could go to porn unlike, way, but they unlike didn't. our show, you can actually yeah. watch it with kids. Yeah, so you can tell the kids that if they are listening at the door, just walk up to the door real quietly, then bang it hard, and you'll find them hitting the floor on the other side. So that's <laughs> funny. Okay. I have a little bit of part two in the news, unless you were done with your news. I didn't oh, want to I had one yours. more thing. I oh, just wanted ahead. to shout out the Akutas, yes. uh, Mike and Denise oh, Okuda. Yeah. They got the Lifetime Achievement Award. And, and uh, this was, can you imagine the amount of work that these two people have put within Star Trek? Because Mike Okuda started in 86 on Star mm -hmm. Trek, The Voyage Home. He's responsible for the light cars. That's that's the one with the the, the one with the whales. If people don't know what the voyage home is, yeah. and and uh, Denise, Meh. 
Denise was actually an extra in the motion picture back in, in the 1979. It so. was really cool. If you ever seen the convention, the nicest couple you ever want to meet. So quiet and unassuming. And very, when, very and when cool. they're up on the stage in the panels, you know, you're getting the authentic Star Trek. Yep. Right out of them because they are the authentic Star Trek. Yep. They made the Star Trek encyclopedia books. Yeah, they're, it's, it's amazing. So that's well-deserved. The news that I have here is that David Cronenberg, outstanding director, but he's also an actor and he gave an interview to Explorer magazine about his time acting on Discovery. So that is actually a really good read if you want to go into it. Just look up for Explorer magazine. Wait a minute. Our fans read? Yeah, they do. They have okay. to because they got to do something when they're not busy watching porn. So yeah, there's subtitles. Okay. And he <laughs> says about how he enjoys it because it kind of takes him back to a childlike innocence. So he's really, really interested. And he's, of course, wants to. They went to him asking whether or not if he would be curious about joining the third season of Discovery. And his response was just like any of us would be. Of course, who wouldn't be? <laughs> so he was a fan. And he never dreamt that we would actually be on the show. So he's really happy to do it. The second part of my news, if you happen to be in the Los Angeles area and you listen to this premiere, you have plenty of time to do it. Uh, number one and I will be at the Los Angeles Comic Con. We're going to be on the table that has the entire floor. It's going to be all Star Trek people. The fleet. In the west wing of the convention center. Right. And go ahead, number one, tell them our table location. Well, they haven't assigned tables yet, but we're going to be in the area that's 502 A and B. So if you look on your map, that's what's going to be. You have Admiral Philip Watermer is uh, head of an organization called The Fleet, and they've been tasked with providing entertainment for the entire floor. So there's going to be a lot of Cleons walking around singing songs. Are we going to get Orion dancers half naked? I was trying for that. So there's going to be triple cornhole. There's going to be all kinds of stuff that's going to be happening on We're going to cornhole a triple? Yeah. So it's going to be the 17th oh first is going to be working in conjunction <laughs> with the fleet in order to provide a really good Star Trek environment. The Shell Nichols is going to be there as well as several other surprise TOS actors. So you got time to show up. So make Dougie sure you Jones there. will be there. And if you tell me that you heard about it on the podcast, I will have a small token for you. So there's that. He's going to put his dick in your hand. (laughs) (laughs) It's a a small token. I don't want that token. It's a small token token that would grow with interest. So (laughs) so we don't count millimeters in growth. Oh, my God. Uh, Where's the airlock button? Oh, damn. The dot moved it. He must like you. Where is it? Man. can't find it. I'll have to look I for it I told the dot to stop moving stuff. I know. I, I got to tell him not to move it. Okay. Now, today, um, this is going to be a, an internal joke. All right. So, I'm just letting you know now. So, who's doing the recap? Anybody knows who's doing the recap this week? I wonder. I don't I wonder know. Who, who, yeah. the, who's doing the recap? Hey, Patrick. Patrick, who's doing the recap? Fuck all y'all. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing the recap this week. Okay. <laughs> Let's okay. go. Because I checked the spreadsheet. It was empty. <laughs> just, just like your brain. <laughs> okay, so, let's get started. <laughs> this week we are doing Star Trek Discovery Season 4, Episode 2, Anomaly. Not to be confused with Enterprise Season 3, Episode 2, Anomaly. Now, this is the first time. They're both time, episode. Oh, God. <laughs> both of them. Oh, this wow. is the first time in the Star Trek franchise that an episode title has been recycled. It first aired November 25th, 2021. Teaser. With black holes, size matters. Book is dealing with some heavy PTSD, ruminating about the past as he watches the replay video over and over again. Michael tries to reach out, but he verbally pushes her away. Good timing, because Michael is called away to greet Saru. He's back on the ship. They catch up, and we learn that Saru is a council member on his planet. He was offered command, but turned it down. He would rather be Michael's number one. Aww. 
Make it so. It is done. Later, Discovery is having a meeting with the higher-ups, telling them that Book's planet was ripped apart by two spiraling black holes five light years in size. Discovery needs to gather data to learn more about it. They jump to the location, put the object on screen with a filter, of course, and it is breathtakingly enormous. So at the beginning of this, I was like, okay, is this Alfred Booker Hitchcock, the birds? What's going on here? It looked like it, right? <laughs> totally. It the, really looked like it. The uh, the flashing of all the memories and he's jogging through it like you do with your shuttle video. That was it, it, it meant to me, it meant something to me because he's reviewing this footage over and over again, and he's agonizing over every last little detail he can look at. That was pretty bad. It reminded me of basically our horrible event that happened, uh, 9-11. It reminded me of that because it was one of the first big, horrible events. And there's been events, but that was probably one of the bigger ones where you had the video coverage. You could sit there and scroll over in agonizing detail. It was horrifying. And mm. traumatic, very traumatic. So I can feel the pain that book is going through right here. Oh, show. Yeah, yeah. It, it was really because you sit there and you play armchair. Uh, oh, my God. What is that phrase? Patrick, uh, armchair quarterback. Thank you. About your actions. You sit there and you play them all in your head. What can you have done differently? What can you done differently? And that's what he sits there and he's just agonizing over the whole thing. It's like, I, if I'd done this, this would be different. If I'd done that, that would have been different. And you can go crazy. Mm. Well, I mean, he's, an, like he's an endangered species. He's the only one left of his, of his kind that we know of. So, yeah, I mean, don't know. that on top of it, I mean, that's just like. Yeah, you, you know. don't know who's, who's left or where they're off planet. Like when Vulcan got destroyed. Well, hope to his. God someone took a vacation to Risa. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, really. Yeah, yeah, and this is only two days after it actually happened. So yeah, that's the, the that's like two days after is not enough time to get over something like this. Oh no, I, it's going to take him a agree. long time. And that know. anomaly being five light years apart, do you know how many miles that is? A lot. <laughs> Twenty twenty nine trillion three hundred ninety three thousand one hundred twenty seven million miles. A lot. It's so the yeah. size of your ass. <laughs> you know, it's almost the size of Rocky's member. Hey, so you, well, that's true. Can you imagine if that was if you had to drive that in L.A. traffic, you would die. <laughs> <laughs> now that you puts in perspective. Die. That puts totally in perspective now. <laughs> yeah, I would just turn around and go back home and say, sorry. I can't make it. Did you guys notice that they had a uh, Ferengi at the meeting? He looked a little crispy. I noticed that. He yeah. Yeah. Well, he was in the trailer that people saw and freaked out because, oh my God, the Ferengi looks different. This guy's just got a little bit of sun. I mean, come on. No, he yeah. could be. He just spent he too could, much time on Ryza. Well, he could be. <laughs> he, could be he could be an intergender blend of a Ferengi and a Klingon. Kinky. You know, yeah. They, they could have. He just didn't have the helmet head. There wasn't anything really Klingon about it. You didn't see any ridges, right? You wanted to see ridges. I was thinking old well, lost I mean, ruffle, ruffles or ridges. I was going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> whoa. whoa. So that was nice to see that they finally decided that the universe is, is not all one shade. So that was cool. Oh, yes. I, I agree. That is cool. You get variations in tone. Mm -hmm. One uh, one part I really liked in this section was when Tilly and Saru were talking and Tilly said, uh, hell, life is just a blink, huh? It's one heartbeat in the entire lifespan of the universe. And Saru said, how we choose to spend our moments in this short time is what matters. That we have is what matters. And then he put like an arm around our back and everything. I thought that was really sweet. And then he said that, can you believe that Star Trek First Contact is 25 years old now? <laughs> well, it was, well, I thought it was funny though, was um, Tilly was like, you know, you seem taller. Oh, that <laughs> yeah. was cute. And you want to talk about size difference. When, when Saru got back with Bird of the hug, the size difference in the hug was like, wow. Yeah. But you know, he's tall. I think part yeah. of it is though is the boots. Well, no, not the boots. <laughs> but when we first meet Saru, he's still that Kelpian who thinks that you know the Baul are gonna are gonna you know call oh, him. Well, well, Tilly called it out. She said, "You got some swagger now." That's that's yeah. what it is. is yeah. He's got more experience and he's walking more confident, and it just yeah. happens to make him look a little taller. Little known fact is that most people who join, almost everybody who joins the military, or at least not the military, but the Marines, when they come out of boot camp, they're actually one to two inches taller. Oh, wow. Because they're forced to stand up straight. 
So they actually have to throw their shoulders back and straighten up. And when they do that, it actually decompresses their spine and they grow. Oh. Shoulders back, tits out. More inches. Yeah. So <laughs> it, it gets that way. Well, I guess dancers too, because that's what they say. And I hear you say that when you put the scan on. So um, <laughs> it was, it was, and what he said, like Rocky had mentioned, it's a really deep saying. We don't realize just how quickly life can pass us by until somebody's taken from us. And then you sit there and you agonize over, man, I could have spent more time. I could have done this. And all of that is missed opportunity. So you should always go out there. And if there's somebody you you have feelings for, let them know. What's the worst they can say? You shoot you down and then you sit in the corner and cry and suck your thumb. <laughs> you gave it a shot. So is so, that why you're in the corner so much? Yeah, Ooh, but damn. that's a different corner, sir. Yeah, I know why you're in the corner and that's not a thumb <laughs> that you're sucking. So we're going to leave that alone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. So, I just wanted to uh, bring up the little Saru was offered the uh, command of the USS Sojourner. That and was cool. that name was like, wait a minute, that I've heard that before. Where have I heard that name before? Well, it landed on the surface of Mars with an airbag. If you guys remember, it was launched back in 96. It was one of the Mars oh, no rovers. Kidding. Yeah. And they called it Sojourner. And it's the one that bounced on an airbag. They did. They were like, well, this is our crazy idea. We're going to airbag a rover and it's going to bounce and then it's going to land up right. And if it doesn't land right, it's, it's going to flip a thing and then become upright and yeah. roll right on off and t- start doing science. And that's this is what's... not that time. <laughs> <laughs> also, a little bit of trivia to go further back. Sojourner Truth was a African-American woman that was into abolitionists and a women's rights activist. And she fought really hard for women's rights to vote and to get rid of slavery from back in the day. Wait a minute. She, she was into ab- abalone shells? You know, abolitionist. So okay. it was it was uh, she was a huge women's rights activist and she really helped push to get women's the right to vote as well as to get rid of slavery and equal rights. Cool. So that's she was trying to get rid of, of equal rights. No, she wants to she have said. equal rights, not to get rid of it. She was really born Isabella bomb free, but she was known as so she was Trump. the bomb. So she was the bomb. <laughs> yep. So she became the first black woman to actually win a case against a white man when she wanted to get her son back. Oh, cool. So a little oh, bit of more trivia information wow. down there. That was I was just gonna talk about a little rover. You guys brought it <laughs> way, way the more serious history. Okay, well, cool. I, I I had to. I'm sorry. Well, that's why it's good to have a second set of eyes, especially yeah, when there's a crisis. True. Uh, or the Navarre Science Institute uh, at your disposal. I, I just yeah. make eyes. I just make eyes. <laughs> Having okay, a crew ahead. is way better than one person. Mm-hmm. The the big uh, pre- would you call it a press conference or a, a meeting of the heads? What 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 would you call that when they're big on um, the roundtable meeting? The talking heads. Yeah, yeah, they were all talking about. Of course, books walks in right at the exact time they're going to show the replay, and I it's know. like, oh damn Talk it, about bad luck, <laughs> bad timing, man. <laughs> but. Um, so they like, OK, they say, hey, we, we've got this huge black hole. It's got big waves. We don't, don't talk know about anything like that. What's going on? Uh, but the math doesn't lie. This, this and that. And they could put they put all the facts that they know. And we don't know much about it. And then everyone starts asking questions that they just said, we don't know much about it and we need to get more data. But then they start, well, where's it all going? And what's it going to stop? And what's going, you know, they're like, we don't know. <laughs> just the, it's, it seems to be like one of those press conferences where they sit there drone on for 20 minutes. I know. And never say anything. Well, the first question that gets asked is like, well, no, we're not commenting on that because we didn't say we knew anything about it. You know, just, or just like we, yeah. we have a new car that's coming out. We don't know exactly when it's coming out, what it's capable of. So when's the new car coming out? Yeah. What's it capable of? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what, does it do? <laughs> what type of luxury items will it have? Yeah. <laughs> like somebody escort him out the room. <laughs> Yeah, but that was cool. Uh, the other, the other big, big words in this show, or this, this, especially this act, openness and unified strategy will be critical. And that was be, just before they said prepare for civil unrest. And and it was like, okay, th- that was a little triggering. And and then to hear this quote, openness and unified strategy will be critical. It means we've got to work together. And you know, this anomaly is going to affect everybody. Everybody, we've got to work together. Yeah. And then somebody said, well, I ain't wearing no mask. And mm. then I was triggered into a oh hole. Yeah. My. <laughs> yeah so, oh my. So, I, but it, but it's, you sit back and realize how idiotic cer- certain things are about, about the way the world is going right now. And yeah. they kind of just touched on that just a little bit. One of the things which I thought was also kismet 
in a way. They were talking about how it's a binary roaming black hole. And um, William Shatner has a show called The Unexplained, and they're talking about the different ways that the Earth can be destroyed. And one of those things is, guess what? Black hole. That there is such a thing as wandering black holes. And then people are really scared of the Hadron Collider because they feel they're going to make a black hole by accident and suck the Mm -hmm. Earth away. So it was it was interesting to hear that kind of like sync up. Yeah, but the Hadron Collider, I mean, that's been around for how many years? Yeah, it's people on realized fear because they said that if it even did create a black hole, it would be a microscopic black hole that would collapse in on itself before it did anything. Mm. like so, your face yeah you're in a rare mood today dude <laughs> so but it's, it's definitely was interesting to hear that and if you have a chance to see william shatner of course because he's kirk sit on a stool and talk about death and gloom it's the unexplained or you'll need a polarizing spectrographic filter to look at kirk so it was definitely <laughs> interesting no, no that's what you use to look at black holes oh same difference and, and, and they look so much bigger with the filter on. Yeah, this is true. And I love Tilly. Tilly's doing her science stuff, you know, but then the president, she comes up and, she, uh, well, no, it wasn't the president. That was Who last was episode, sir. That was, no, no, no. I'm, I'm thinking the wrong one. It's the, it's the woman. What was her name? The president. The, the president of Vulcan? Triana. Yeah. No, the president, yeah, the president of, of yeah, Navarre. Of, I'm sorry. I said Vulcan, uh, the president of Navarre. The pre- oh, yeah. OK, Navarre. So Trina. that was cool that she she was there, that they showed that the Vulcans, this, when they wanted not to do anything with the Federation, they're back in the fold. They were willing to help. And I thought that was huge. Well, I mean, the science magnitude yeah. of what's going on is kind of uh, a big curiosity. Right. Plus, re- they want to know re- if it's going to destroy their planet. It requires all to contribute. Well, this is true. Yeah. Well, it doesn't choose sides. It's not like the binary black hole is going to say, oh, you guys are, you know, Vulcan. We don't care about you so much. You know, it's, it's and, not, it doesn't do that. It's a fucking hmm. binary black hole and it's going to affect everybody that it runs into, regardless of who they are. Can we talk about Saru coming onto the bridge and them calling him Mr. Saru? I'm like, wait a minute. Don't be Spock on him yet. Well, I I thought Mr. <laughs> Saru sounded good. I, I I thought they were they should have been calling him Mr. Saru for quite a while. Yeah, it's it's an honorary title. You do that to somebody. I guess if they don't have rank, you can say Mr. So and So. Higher ranks usually use it for lower ranks. But I'm curious. I don't know how they do on that structure. But it was kind of cool for him to be on the bridge. And that what was that a cooperation symbol he has on his uniform? looked really cool against the black background. It was pretty impressive. Yeah. It was yeah. a community, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, decorative pin. thing, pin. Yeah, it's a community yeah. pin. He's involved in the, the council or whatever. I think that yeah. was kind of nifty. It was. And yeah. again, another uniform. They hate cosplayers. I swear, every season they do this <laughs> shit just to piss us off. They're like, okay, you guys finally get that uniform done. Everyone's got the great pattern on it. It looks great. Here's a new one. You know what, though? I hear this one's very, very comfortable. I saw a clip on, I think it was through Twitter, but it was one of the Paramount official clips where Stamets and the doctor were talking about how comfortable these new uniforms are. Yeah, well, like they were pajamas. I yeah. was like, oh, that's so cool. It's like, yeah, yeah that get, sounds awesome. I got to wait till my favorite vendor in China can duplicate it. <laughs> <laughs> I can buy yet another uniform. So yeah, it was pretty good. Anybody else got anything else to say about this this section before we can get out of the That was just the teaser. Yeah, I know. It was a pretty big teaser. Yeah, it mm-hmm. was. That's what she said. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> Hi, Captain. So act one. We're all mad here. This is not what they were expecting. I mean, it's missing the second black hole for Christ's sakes. They must get closer to conduct their scans, but that's in the yellow zone where discovery would be at a great risk. I think they tell you in the yellow zone. They they tell you. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Book offers his ship and services, but Michael doesn't think he's in the right mind to get the job done. After a lover's quarrel, Michael relents and agrees and lets Book go on the mission. Meanwhile, Gray has an initial meeting with his new body for any last minute adjustments. They use the soon method when creating it. And spoilers, just so you know, turn it off now. This is the same Gollum Picard used when he dies at the end of season one, but lives forever in his synth body as an AI robot. And they even mention Picard. Squee! 
Time to set up Stamus in a virtual reality machine so he could join Book on his ship as a hollow. This will keep his body safe back on Discovery and there will be a tether between Book's ship and Discovery to maintain access to the hollow and keep a good proximity to Discovery. If anything bad happens, they could pull Book's ship back in. Too bad being socially awkward doesn't count. Stamus is going to have a tough time with this one. Book goes into the void having to deal with large debris and one seriously annoying scientist. It gets worse when he starts to have his PTSD flashbacks of his nephew and falling birds. Back on Discovery, the ship is being hit by gravitational waves causing all sorts of chaos and damage. Getting a, that shouldn't have happened, from Tilly. That was was pretty wild. First off, to be able to look at yourself and go, yeah, I don't like that on my hand. Could you get rid of it? (laughs) And they didn't talk about the parts they made bigger. Yeah. You know that because, you know, multiple techniques and all. And they kept changing the pronoun. I was curious. They say she's body, their body, his body. I think, I think Gray is actually identifying as male, but. But they did say she, her body. They did mention that. I don't think so. Yeah. Watch it again with the subtitles. They did say her body. Well, just because the subtitle said her doesn't mean that's what they No, she, they also said it. If I'm wrong, correct me next week. But I, I do believe that they said that. What, you mean that you think I'm going to just watch the episode again just to make sure to correct you? No. In order to do that, yes, you would. You know you would. You know you love correcting me. So, yeah. So that I thought that was that was definitely interesting. I, I thought it was, it was amazing that I was completely thrown off. I mean, I was like, I saw the image of Gray on the left. I'm like, oh, it's great. It's looking at, and I didn't realize. <laughs> like it took an extra second to process. Gray was looking at gray. <laughs> it was gray on gray imagery. And I was a little confused. Uh, did you notice that you hear the dots suck their teeth? <laughs> when he says we could, we could send a dot to go check it out. No, we can't send the dots. The dots are like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the dots are like all eh, pissed off. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> they were all like, what the hell? I, I, They're like we're expendable. It's just like, it's a bunch of dust and debris. And like what the dots could take, you know, the dots actually, they're a little too small for that debris. And especially the dust particles. When you see later in the scene, when, when, flying through the dust is actually the size of nut dust i mean it was huge chunks i like yeah. i like yeah. stamets though he was like he's like i'm curious or i'm curious or he's like i have no idea what we're looking at it's bizarre and that's a scientific observation yeah it's like a what <laughs> <laughs> yeah i really like that alice in wonderland quote mm-hmm Curiouser and curious. Interesting. I uh, I wanted to shout out the editor of the show, Chad Rubel, because I was one of the people I follow on Twitter. Because when they when I found somebody on Twitter that said they were the editor for Discovery, I thought that was pretty cool. Chad posted a picture of his editing timeline of the finished version of this episode. And for all video editors, it's kind of cool to take a look at because you can see all the way they've got it organized, what the tracks look like, how many audio channels he's got it all mixed down to and how many levels they use to uh, put effects on top of effects on top of effects. It's pretty fascinating. So I wanted to shout that out because I thought that was nerd cool from my point of view. Very cool. Nothing to do with the show, except that it was the show. I just w- I wanted to mention that. I thought it was really cool. So mm-hmm. how many audio tracks do they have? A few. Oh. <laughs> and I and I imagine that's just a temp. I, I imagine they uh, get it into a mix process and it's even more tracks being put in. Yeah. But uh, it's, yeah, so it's, that, a, it's a tracky track. Yeah. So that was kind of nifty. Cool. Yeah, I thought it was kind of when they go to prepare and they go to head in and well, first off, anybody would be nervous because you get a book is this like now he's kind of like a legendary pirate slash thing and Michael's lover. And so, of course, you know, Stamets is going to be nervous. Well, you so, know, what was really nervous. <laughs> Stamets wasn't even going to be in the physical thing. In fact, he, I know. He, he's like, no, 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 no. You're going to go as a hollow. I was like, oh, because I thought you were going to send like <laughs> both of the two people that know how to spore drive this sucker. And uh, and you're just going to send me over onto a ship to almost absolute death. Uh, but no, <laughs> you're, you're just going to be a hollow. You might as well yeah. blow me out an airlock. Exactly. Blow the hook off oh, too soon. That was, so yeah, that was funny. funny. That was a little sensitive, that was wasn't it? so sensitive. So funny. Now, if you guys don't know, this is a reference to Burnham actually doing that and using the Vulcan nerve pinch on Samus and kicking him out of the airlock. In Discovery Season 3, Episode 12, there is a tide. Also, if you're not a Vulcan and you try to do the Vulcan nerve pinch like for real, all you're going to really do is piss somebody off. (laughs) <laughs> you got to do it really, so, really, really hard. You do to it make really it work. hard and it does hurt, <laughs> but I've been unsuccessful in knocking anybody out. So there's that. Uh, 
I liked Michael's quarters. I mean, she's got a hollow in her quarters. She was at the cliffs of Ciroc. I know. Yeah, that was pretty. It was interesting. There's a theme going on with this episode, and it is a post-traumatic. Uh, we, mm. we were talking about how do all these Starfleet personnel go through all this crazy fucking shit and come out and do it again week after week. And this episode actually kind of points to how they deal with post-traumatic stress. They're actually talking to yeah. each other about their problems and dealing with this stuff. And not just one character. There's several characters on here that are dealing with PTSD. And, yep. you know, next section, even till asked the doctor for you know therapy mm -hmm. like everyone's going through ptsd well i know you're always reconfiguring your room there heather with, with your hollow emitters yeah constantly the dots are always <laughs> going in and out as you're reprogramming and rearranging well that's because she tries to cook stuff in her in her quarters and it burns the wall so she has to reconfigure things you gotta cover up the yeah. wall <laughs> yeah. yeah i don't think it, i don't think it's just that because i tried to find out exactly what are you playing in there and it was on a security lockout and because well, you're the scientist i couldn't figure out what it is that you you're having this play in there i swear to god i did not get it from pornhub uh -huh. Maybe what kind of experiments are you doing over there nothing <laughs> Um, the um, other question we were talking about was uh, Book going. Why are we going to send Book to this? Well, it's obvious that Book is the only guy that can fly his ship. I mean, Detmer's good, yep. but but Book is very familiar with how to make it uh, do the transforming moves because it's a transformer and he knows how to make it do that stuff. Yeah, or that ship. means the eye. And, yeah, it's uh, his ship. Just and, like with you, Rocky, if you drive your vehicle, if something's wrong, I as a passenger may not know, but you automatically, since you drive it all the time, you know right off the bat, something doesn't feel right. Yeah, well, you know. It's it's like somebody who's driven a stick before and, you know, you get, you get in the car. It's like, I can drive a stick versus the person that drives it automatic. Was like, I don't know. I can make it go, but I don't know if I can do the shifting right. Mm -hmm. You don't want that person to be driving while you're trying to fly mm -hmm. into a, 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 a bisexual black hole. What? what? No. And, and, and you know exactly how fast you can bisexual go around the corner before hole. you start to lose control. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that too. Um, but, and then also the other issue of this was Burnham and... The, the, it was basically the needs of the many, but mm. she was on that mm. side of the equation where versus the one. And that's where the one doesn't win because the needs of the many outweighed her needs of keeping book alive to herself. Yeah. And don't you like the computers now named herself Zora? Yeah, that was so awesome. I did a little squee. <laughs> I can't wait to yeah. see more of the crazy computer stuff that happens. And, and it's that great to know the captain is regularly talking with Zora. And it, and it kind of leads also back where you have the the Star Trek short where and she introduced herself to the guy as Zora. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it, it's becoming true. So I'm curious on how they're going to put a bow in that one. Well, because the, um, the computer is sentient. Yeah, it's sentient now with all that data from the sphere. Yeah. And in Calypso, it was like, what, a thousand years later? And yeah, a thousand years in the future. Yeah, yeah, the crew hasn't been there in a long time and she's been evolving. So I'm really curious on that. And she said, wait for them. So I'm surprised it's going to be another time travel thing or, or, or what? So it's, uh, it's uh, interesting. Oh, you think the computer's got a little um, foresight into the future? It's it's a possibility because with that short that they had, where she said the crew told me to wait here for them to come back. And she says it's been a thousand years, but she didn't say it's a thousand years since she jumped into that universe or a thousand yeah. years since they left her. Ooh. So Ooh. it's going to be interesting on how they're going to bring that together. And this guy, obviously, there's some sort of conflict because I forgot the guy's name already that was on the ship that he went and took a shuttle to go see if he can make it to his family. So there's some sort of conflict. So there's a lot of road that we have to travel before we get there. I like the anti-grav situation where everyone's like, <laughs> and, and they're like, seat belts, please. Yeah, that was wild. And please, then, and then, seat and Zora's, belts. The Zora's like, it will pass in now. <laughs> <laughs> that yeah, was funny. Like, so that was a very precise countdown. Thanks a really lot. Funny. Did you see the the um the after show with uh, Will Wheaton when she was saying when Michael Burnham was like that really worked out your core when they did that because <laughs> everybody was in harnesses and stuff. Yeah, and, 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 she, oh, and she's just guess. coming back from having a second child too not I know. long ago. Oh my gosh, they made her do that after having a second child. She said her core was burning. <laughs> 
Oh, that I, poor woman. The, yeah, that's it's it's a, they call them a harness and uh, they they put you in them and then they fly you around the room with them and it's incredibly cool and those shots looked amazing. They, they did. And, but I'm just crying out. Wait a minute. If they were wearing seatbelts, what would have happened? It just the, the, I mean the status report. Uh, I can't reach my station. <laughs> that was funny. <laughs> like shoot. Status report. I can't see it from up here. Uh, yeah, I, was, I, I'll get back funny. to you when I get back to my station. Uh, I'm floating in the middle, middle of the fucking bridge. <laughs> yeah, but did you hear they actually gave the explanation why they flew up in the air? Because they said that the anomaly was too strong and happened too fast for the gravity compensators to do anything. Yeah, yeah. You, you've got to have a seatbelt. Oh, yeah. This is why we need seatbelts on starships. Yes. I agree. Even but- Book was like... Um, I'm going to go secure grudge. Yeah. So he put the cat in a box. The cat was secure, but they're floating around and not. Yeah, but he belts. wasn't. He wasn't. He cared more for the. Well, that's a guy. He'll care more for the. <laughs> she's a queen. I, I really liked what they said right before that uh, happened, where Stamus goes to pet grudge. And he's like, oh, hey, girl. And Book's like, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> yeah. Hollows freak her out. She can't smell you. And so, I'm like, I want to so, see grudge freak out. Uh, that would be wild. <laughs> so, so we know that if a hollow is there in person it could fart and you would have no idea unless it was audible oh you know what so he you, would he would actually fart on discovery but you couldn't smell it on book <laughs> yeah so book would be like what's why is everyone making that so, joke no it's not you can't smell it yeah so that makes that statement invalid whoever smelt it dealt it so he well, no, it's it. only valid Ooh, because he would be smelling it. it and he obviously dealt it, but oh, no one else would smell it. So okay. that, that the phrase is valid, sir. I, I would use that as a logic equation to V'ger and see what would happen. <laughs> <laughs> but that nice. was that was pretty cool. That was a V'ger a really... must merge with creator. <laughs> V'ger must merge with creator. <laughs> creator. Ah, yes. <laughs> Uh, you know, this was uh, the section had me between this section and the next couple sections. They were always ready to pull out. And had you up in the air? No, it, I was I was giggling every time they said pull out. Yeah, that was funny. <laughs> pull out of the airlock. No, they had them on a tether. <laughs> they, they put. I actually kind of like the tether. I thought the tether technology was really a good solution because how else are you going to, you know, reel the ship back in against these gravitational forces? I thought they said Heather at first. I'm like, wow, they're stretching <laughs> Heather that far. Oh my God. So I got a question with the tether. The only way Stamus could be on that ship as a hollow is because of the tether, right? So when they released the tether, why did Stamus stay on the ship with well, no I, was I two separate technologies? That. Yeah. I was thinking about that. And um, the only thing I can come up with, the tether was supposed to relay information back and forth. And when the tether broke, it kind of gave Stamus to be his own self-contained unit with no information or lead back. So basically, I think that Stamus was still Stamus. Stamets. Stamets. Uh, yeah. Well, I say well, Stamus too. But Stamets. I, I agree with you about the data transfer, but when they were talking, him and the doctor were talking about how this was going to work right before he left, I got the impression, and I could be wrong, I got the impression that they needed the tether to I keep- agree with you. I, no, I, see, I, I, the same I, thing. I wasn't thinking that at all because I, I knew the hollow technology was a separate information transfer, uh, you know, basically. Basically, which which is interesting because you can get enough data to run a hollow, but you can't get enough data to send back. Uh, I, I mean, it's a massive amount of data they're recording, so I can I can get that. So that, that was a little more plausible to me. But the tether itself, I, I wasn't thinking Maybe. the tether was data based. I think the tether was there just to literally pull the ship back. Maybe Book's download speeds were greater than his upload speeds, and that's why they couldn't do it. Well, Book was running fiber. Everybody else was on DSL or cable. So <laughs> yeah, he was he was running Windows ninety eight. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, everybody else is on 11. Well, but it was, yeah, I have to agree. I did think about that. And that's something if I ever get a chance to meet them, I'm going to probably ask because I wonder between my chief and my science officer, which one was right or it's a blend. Well, so I also have uh, thoughts about this, but it refers to something that happens in the next couple sections. So I'm going to okay, hold that. Then we can get ready to go in a little bit on that. And plus, everybody loves a surprise unless it's a surprise gravitational wave. <laughs> <laughs> it sends yeah. everybody in yeah, the air. Yeah, that was like, uh, what the fuck was that? <laughs> it was like, throw your bodies in the air, float around like you just don't care. Especially if you're in the middle of trimming your privates. I mean, you know, that would be just. Oh, my. <laughs> oh, why'd you have to say something like that? <laughs> oh, my God. 
That's why we use sonic trimmers, sir. <laughs> Patrick, did you have that experience? I know some people like to use the razor, but, uh, you know, some people no. like to use the sonic trimmers. I'm au natural. Thank you. <laughs> oh. oh, okay. Let's go to the next section while I try to get that thought out of my head. <laughs> Hi, Captain. Act two, cut him loose. Oh, why'd you say cut? <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. Book and Stamus try their best to collect data while both ships are taking heavy damage. Saru convinces Michael to cut the tether and pull back while Book and Stamus continue gathering data. Not an easy decision for her to make. And it's easier said than done with Book's PTSD flashbacks. I notice they really need Chief on board to Discovery because I notice the same consoles blow up all the time. Yeah. <laughs> I notice they got flame on the ship now. I thought that... Yeah. that that was, I think the effects budget got increased because they're actually setting off practical flames behind everybody. They need to really set up a surge and then put a bigger Zener diode in the circuitry in order to shun a lot of the extra surge <laughs> voltage to ground so they don't blow up like that. I, I mean, I wonder if those are actual practical flames or not, because you can imagine these close ups and the, the actors aren't jumping all over the place. But the, that would put out some heat if you were they're, that close. <laughs> they're they're stamitzing. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh my god, that was so funny when Tim when Tilly's like, I'm so stamping right now. Yeah. <laughs> that was funny. And it was perfect too because everyone knew exactly what the fuck she meant. <laughs> well, yeah, it was kind of obvious. Yeah, and that, uh that it's funny. it's one of those Except for poor Adira. Well, Adira's like just doing her thing and you, but but uh, you, I love that that uh, Cobra runs up and goes, "You know, Adira's trying to impress you, right?" <laughs> it's just <laughs> they're looking up to you and they want to impress you and and, and meanwhile Tilly's stamitzing. Yeah, and she and, and and Cobra had that little face healer thing which was kind of cool. Well, it's handy on the bridge if you happen to be. It's you called to put a dermal your, regenerator. Yes, there you go. If you happen to be, you know, not wearing your safety belt while you're on the bridge and you bounce off the bulkhead, well, yeah, it's handy to have the doctor there with a the dermal regenerator. Put your face back together. Mm hmm. So that explains why Nathan looks the way he does. <laughs> Jeez, number one. Why don't you use them? Exactly. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> scars are <laughs> chicks dig scars, sir. Yes. So that's why I have mine. But it was cool when she says stamitzing. That did make me laugh. And I have to give it to Tilly. She was trying to explain why things were going on the way she was. And again, it just shows the professionalism of the crew. You're in a high stress environment and you still have to think clearly and come up with a solid reason on why things are happening the way they're happening. Did, did any of you guys notice Detmer's face when Michael said to release the tether? Yeah. She was not having it. No. She no, did not you? agree at all. Well, as a pilot, she's looking at a good in a possible situation exactly. and that's the only thing that's keeping it possible is that tether yeah you let that tether go there's really no way of knowing but you know that was a big moment for michael because she knows without that tether there was a really strong possibility that book wasn't going to make it out well fortunately and they still had wi-fi so she could at least talk to them yeah and have stamets aboard it's the cone of silence but it shows that what the president <laughs> said to her last episode kind of resonated with her that she yeah. has to be able to make the decision to sometimes let one person go in order to save the many I think it's it's probably also the next section, but somebody mentioned to her like, separating the captain from the person because the captain knows about the needs of the many and the person does. And there's that internal conflict and you just got to at some point let the tether go. I mean, yikes. That is something when if you're in, I hope people listening will people who are in a combat situation will understand this. If you're in charge of a team and you got to send people out on patrol, you have to wrestle with that idea is that if you're sending in patrol to a, a dangerous area, they're your buddies, they're your friends, but yet you're sending them out hoping that they're not going to die. And with that knowledge to know that they, there's an AP contact, you still got to send them out. And that's mm. that's that's rough to do as a captain. That's a main reason why they don't want fraternization. When you have non-commissioned officers and officers, they don't want them fraternizing because of that very reason. They don't want to become all friendly and, and have feelings and then you have to you wouldn't send them off to die. But then doesn't that just take away the sympathy and empathy and all that? So you don't have that between it, the uh, officers and the... It can and it does. There's a phrase you hear where they say people develop a thousand mile stare. Um, that You saw it a little bit and I give it the actor really good play on that was book the stare that he got reliving that moment and you get people in the military they get shocked like that where they've lost good friends and that thought goes through their head it is anything they could have done it's it's a weird situation because let's say you're standing next to your buddy and all of a sudden their head explodes your first thought 
is that could have been me. And then you feel guilty because you thought that could have been you, you know, that you're actually kind of glad your friend got it, not you. And then you feel guilty about that because they're dead. How can you be happy when your friend died? And then you sit there and you wonder what could you have done to make that person not have died. Then you sit and wonder, well, why did they die? They were better than you. They made people laugh. They were fun. How come fate decide to take them and not you? What made you so you know, perfect to be around. And so you get survivor's remorse. And so it's, it's a lot to go through and a lot to process. And I think the little bit they showed with book was interesting. And of course, because it's a TV show, they'll clean that up and and they'll fix them in no time. Whereas in real life, that will take years in order for a person to rationalize and get it straight. Sure. All right. Now to bring it down, let's go back over there. And what happened to the dots? The dots should have been fine with the anti graph. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're just floating around the ship anyway, but uh, they're still not going outside because the size of those dust particles are like, <laughs> just, like <laughs> just like a bunch of testicles without a jock strap. I said, uh, d- 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 why don't you go outside and take a look at the. They're like, fuck you. <laughs> <It's serious. laughs> the dots go outside. Okay, let's go. Wait, why are we still in the airlock? Shh, they won't know. Just hide in the corners. <laughs> they won't see us. Hide behind the window. They won't see us through the window. <laughs> they, they can't tell if we're outside or not. <laughs> won't they tell? They're flopping around inside the ship. They won't look. <laughs> that would be funny. Yeah, but then you get stamps. What is it, Patrick? Stamets. 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 Is, yeah, yeah, saying don't, that, don't do that anymore, sir. <laughs> okay. No, don't. <laughs> okay. Stamets it said that he still needs a lot more information. Like, how much you need? Five minutes. You got four minutes. No, I fucking need five minutes. <laughs> he said, what, what, what have you got about three minutes? Like, look. Look, I said five minutes and I don't even think that's actually enough time. So come yes. on, come back to me later. It's like, it's probably more like 10 minutes, but I'm saying five minutes. And you said five minutes, five minutes ago. Exactly. I know that was funny. <laughs> he was, he was doing a, a, a Scotty. Well, that's just <laughs> it. You've got to multiply your estimate time so they don't bother you so much when you come, come no. up with them in time. Exactly. So that, that was pretty wild. That scene was a lot of information going back and forth and them trying to figure things out, you know, and then. You can see, again, Book is having problems with post-traumatic stress disorder because they're trying to get him out of there. And she and goes, keeps seeing Lido. Yeah. And he's like, okay, go. And he's like, I just see, now, saw the- If that had been me, I, w- I would have been seeing Kaim instead of Lido. I know you would have. <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't be talking about pulling out either. You would have been running with no pants so I'm down the hallway. <laughs> and then Stamets asks, uh, are you okay? And Book's like, never ask me that again. Yeah, don't ask me that question. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to do that. So <laughs> that was that was a pretty cool. I think that's it for this section. Are we ready for the next? Hi, Captain. Act three, Prodigy mm-hmm. Rerun. Book and Stamus are trying to navigate the impossible, all the while having a therapy session about Stamets's inadequacy. Perfect time to tell Book the data they just risked their lives for can't be transferred back to this ship since the tether was ripped away. Book has to survive and return to Discovery if they're going to get this data. Back on Discovery, Tilly and Adira run onto the bridge, excitedly to telling Michael that they have the answer. They just watched Star Trek Prodigy Season 1, Episode 3, and Janeway inspired them to ride the wave out of this danger. (laughs) Michael agrees to give it a try. And the first time, Book missed, you know, triggered by his PTSD. But unfortunately, that threw him into a spiral of despair and depression, not wanting to give it a second go. Well, this is where Michael invokes the cone of silence. To talk to try and talk, bring book down. Yeah, is that the, this one the or the next on. one? It was like the, she showed up in his DMs. No, I think right. that is she the next section. <laughs> that is the next section, actually. Okay. Um, but yeah, yeah they, it's they, the next section. They, they were catching a wave and you were sitting on top of the world. Uh, uh, it's basic. Uh, Application of fluid dynamics and Newtonian mechanics. It's it's like kite surfing on Manac six yeah, or what was it? Manac four. Yeah, four. <laughs> just I thought that was cool. They used something <laughs> as novel as surfing to solve this solution. Um, ride the wave out, and you can't see the wave unless you can see the like, wave. Dude, and, catch a wave, man! <laughs> check it out. <laughs> and, and I love I, I, I love that uh, it was Burnham's idea. I was like, well, can you make that represent with uh, uh, programmable matter? Until he's like, well, sure. Why, why, the why hell would, would I do, I do that? that? 
<laughs> but it was pretty ingenious. It's like, oh, she could feel the wave and tell him when to go. And I thought that was an awesome thing. At the same time, I'm like, wait a minute, how do you time the, uh, there's got to be a, a time space delay between their distances. And I, I mean, you got subspace going, but is there any time delay to subspace? There's latency, right? I'm like, how would she say go at exactly the right point and time it out to where book would hit the go button and they'd actually go and catch that wave. And just the Zora. mere amount of time. Well, Zora was a good idea. Yeah, Zora good, has an algorithm. That's a good idea. It's um, one of Adira's algorithms. But oh, um, okay. it, well, yeah, actually, it was Adira, wasn't it? But yeah, so the amount of time it took and and for him to just say, wait, are you sure? And because he said that they had that little pause moment, I, it flew the whole thing off and they missed the first wave. Yeah, he was all being fatalistic. Well, he was basically having one of those um, talk to me goose moments. If you guys watch Top Gun, you know, Maverick freaks out over, yeah. you know, in the middle of the situation. He, he goes out of formation and, and he's just going, talk to me, goose. Talk to, so I was waiting for Book to say, talk to me, goose. I'm not sure I've ever seen that. Oh, Tom you Cruise. Saw Top Gun? It's a legendary Tom you Cruise movie. You never saw that? Right out of the 80s. I, I, I know who's in out. it, but I'm like, I don't know that I, I don't recall seeing it. It's, it, you, it's worth seeing. It's, it's the, if you look at it from a, it'd be interesting to look at it from today's viewpoints because the, the, the plot and the, well, the plot's cool, but the way the characters react, the emotional stuff, you look at and go, wait a minute, are these people being real? Captain, we yep. need to kidnap him and like play uh, Top Gun for the uh, movie night and the I agree. I feel the no. need, the need for, for speed. speed. Yeah, we're kidnapping you. We're bringing you to that. Yeah, you have no choice. It was pretty cool. A little trivia: I watched them film that when I was in active duty. Oh, cool! Oh, wow. Well, at least a section of it. There's a part where he's like arguing with the girl, and he gets on his motorcycle and it takes off, and she takes off behind him in the car. I watched them film that for like a week. That little short scene took over a week and we were all pissed because they had extras to act like the military. And we we're like, we're fucking right here. Put us in the film. We're military. <laughs> Put us in. No, no. But they have these actors that are off, off camera. And when they go action, they wave to them and they start walking and act surprised when they go by. And it's like, we can do that. <laughs> yeah, but it didn't happen. Hmm. So, but that was, yeah, you should see it, Patrick, because there's a new Top Gun coming out soon. So, oh yeah, it'll make you appreciate the new one too. Yeah. I'm not that big a Tom Cruise fan though. I mean, he's yeah, like, I wasn't I, there because he was an asshole when we met him. I mean, like it's between him and like Brad Pitt. I'm like, okay, you guys just stop doing movies, you know? <laughs> Why don't you like Brad Pitt? They just, they're in everything. Oh well, yeah, like, they are. I mean, it's like, you know, and jo like Johnny Depp too. I'm just like, I'm, t I'm over Johnny Depp. I'm like, dude, just, just stop. I mean, it's not like you don't have enough money. Go away. <laughs> Well, you know, the rich must get richer. And pro tip, Johnny Depp doesn't believe in underarm deodorant. <laughs> okay, then. How about the next section? Hi, <laughs> uh, Chief. Okay, next section. Act four, trauma bond. Stamus throws a heads up to Discovery about Book's state of mind, and Saru suggests a phone call from his lover instead of his captain. Michael follows Saru's advice and has a private, heart-to-heart -heart phone call with Book, convincing him to try and catch another wave, which is successful. Yay! Discovery has both book and the data back to the ship safe and sound and the crew celebrates. Stamist thanks book for saving his family. Tilly thanks the doctor for his advice with Adira and you know requests to schedule a therapy session with him. Adira is trying to deal with their own PTSD but luckily Gray is there to help. Michael listens to book's pain and also about his hallucinations and to end this Friday the 13th. 13th type day, Tilly tells Saru that the anomaly did a 180 on them, completely changing direction, proving that the anomaly is unpredictable and chaotic. It could strike anywhere at any time. Bum, bum, bum. That gave me pause because of the fact that it changed direction. Was it because it's being chaotic or is it because it's being guided? Don't know. And that's what I, yeah. We're trying to gather data. Exactly. <laughs> so it's like, what the hell? Why did it do that? And then I was very upset as my number one. I asked him to complete a computer model to tell me whether or not if it was sent to you or not. And what did Patrick tell me? I don't have enough information. <laughs> just like the show. You, you just went out there to gather a whole bunch of data and you still don't have enough data. <laughs> I know. 
so that was that was that was wild it was one of those it's it's really how much of a big mystery this is it's doing something we don't know what it's doing we don't know why it's doing and and you can't just turn the black hole on and off again (laughs) seriously well yeah. And how come I don't have a cone of silence? Yes. You do, sir. It's a direct message mode and you ever you never seem to use it. Oh. Every time you think he's using it, he punches it and he's talking right to us and everybody hears it. But Oh, really? You hit the wrong button, sir. Yeah, we all hear. We we heard what you said to Patrick. Damn it. Yeah. Okay, let me let me let me let okay, I gotta look at that. After this, I'm gonna get with you, Pat, and you're gonna show me this this new button layout. So my question is is with this cone of silence, that was only on Michael on Discovery, right? So Book didn't have that cone of silence. Yeah, meanwhile, so Stamets, Stamets is hearing everything. Yeah, did Stamets like listen to the whole conversation with them? I was like, I'm in the room too. He's like, no, I he can did. hear you. <laughs> He's Speakers sitting there. on. He's sitting there staring straight ahead, trying not to move, giving him the side <laughs> eye. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then afterwards he goes to his lover. Guess what I heard? You know, well, that's what that big hug was. Yeah. <laughs> when he gets yeah. back, he's like, the things I've heard. Cool. <laughs> well, I like uh-huh. that Stamets finally tells book that you know why he's awkward with him he's like well you saved my family he's like you did what i couldn't do and and, you know every time i look at you i see that and it makes me uncomfortable yeah yeah i could yeah uh that was a really good reveal because it shows that when he looks at him he's reminded of his own perceived inadequacies exactly yeah i thought that the connections that they had the conversations that they had the reconciliations that they had although timed horribly because right in the middle of an event like that you don't want to have these discussions but uh, and that's why it's a good reason to talk to people when you get a chance to because if you have to do it in the middle of a you know emergency situation it's it's horrible in the timing but right? i like that they were having it and i think it's going to bring these two characters even closer together it's- because the, uh, i mean he said you didn't talk i mean you talked to me more now than you had in the last 5 months and it's just like whoa wait a minute yeah really (laughs) but seriously it's like um you're gonna have a stressful conversation with someone so let's make this better and have it during a stressful event so we can combine the two and make this even more stressful yeah yeah, you don't want to multitask that no not good that is that's just like you with somebody and you're getting ready to have a moment and you whisper in the ear are you sure you don't have any ed problems that oh just my. that's bad timing yeah it's just <laughs> it's like shit <laughs> and then you're done you're done yes yeah. so before you started you're done yeah pretty much so it was an exciting episode in my opinion the way they tried to resolve everything and the fact that they went in the air not once but twice they had the body surf which was pretty cool special effects yeah you know so that was that was good what did you think on a scale of one to ten on well, this wait, wait hold on hold on the one last thing i wanted to bring up was um, well, you were so quiet i thought you were done no 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 when um tilly got at the very end when tilly's talking to culber and she bring up the fact that she's not doing well again here's discovery bringing to light issues you know yeah good point yeah i I like the the coverage of this yeah the mental health the 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 post-traumatic stress they're dealing with it finally we've seen them go through so much in these four seasons so far well we get the beginning of the fourth season but now to see them actually really deal with it and talk about it versus just toughing it out you know and then culber's like go save the world she's like oh i will well yeah she's like (laughs) okay (laughs) it shows you you can't tell on the surface when people are dealing with issues because they push it down you can't never judge a book by its cover no and you don't realize it because the pages are either going to be like really scrambled or they're going to be blank yeah and you people forget the really nicest people are nice like that because they've been through hell and they understand what it is to go through hell so that's why they're nice you never never ever ever want to push a nice person to not be nice anymore because you awaken the demon and that's not a good thing amen wait a minute are we talking about Willis Heim? No, well, not that one. one. That's, okay. a, that's, <laughs> that's a, a good series if y'all haven't checked it out yet. So, but that's another podcast. So I'll let you listen to them. <laughs> But it was really good. But yeah, you always, always realize that people who tend to do things for you is because they would love someone to do that to them for themselves. But a lot of people don't. They don't spend the time to reach out. They don't spend the time to connect. Is that why you give hand jobs? To myself. <laughs> how do you know that number one? Wait, wait, wait. How do you know that? <laughs> seriously. I've, I've heard. Wait, I've heard through the grapevine. No, this is not a grapevine. You this were a- asking? There's a freaking no. camera no, on the was, side of my room. I just heard through the grapevine. 
Where's the camera? In my- <laughs> so now he just wanted to confirm before, you know. Oh, my God. It, 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 you, I can't believe you want the captain's log. I can't. Oh, no. That <laughs> no, I don't. Uh-huh. Ooh. Ooh not la gonna la. Happen. So, but it was definitely interesting. You had any other points to bring up before we start bringing it to a close there? How about just, you there, just Chief? Just the last thing that Adira said. She's like, I guess I made waves. Okay, no. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was funny. I, I did find that, that, was that funny. Yeah. Yeah. That was a attempt. I mean, that was, it was an attempt at bad humor, but it was badly performed well. <laughs> if that makes any sense was, at all. That was funny. Yeah. And, and how about you, Chief? Um, you got anything to bring up before we start? No, no not clothes? much. I mean, I, I the usual stuff. I mean, the, the Tilly's talking and uh, and at the end of this book is starting to talk too. So they're starting to deal with the stresses of what they just went through, especially book, what he just went through. And, and he's got a, he, I mean, he cried at the end. I mean, I they're gone. They're all gone. It finally, that's a moment of catharsis that that's when the healing can actually start when you can let go and cry. And how about you, Heather? You got anything to bring up for the final point? Nope. Um, I just want to give my score. I give this a nine after listening to what Patrick said about them bringing up mental health and making it normal and making it like this is just n- like normal health that you got to take care of. This is I, historic. I really like that a lot. And I give this episode a nine. That's historic. I don't think you've ever given a discovery a nine. That's that's pretty cool. How about you, Pat? What'd you give it? I'm going to give it an eight. Um, I really enjoyed it. I thought it had a lot of it. It did tie in the the PTSD, the mental health. I mean, that was a thread throughout the entire episode, really. And how do you deal with it and or and or don't deal with it? But yeah, it was really good. I liked it. And the fact that the gray gets to see his body now. Yay. And, how, and how about you there, Chief? Oh, I'm, I'm totally a nine. Definitely because they brought all this stuff up and to see that. But at the same time, the excitement and mystery of what we know, although it was a little annoying, finally going on a mission to find out what we can find out about this anomaly. And at the end of the whole episode, we really, even though we know a lot more, we still don't know. In fact, we, we, we know that we, we know don't that- know now exactly we know that we don't we don't know anything about it <laughs> we know that we don't know and it changed directions so we don't know what the hell's going on and now it's moving to other directions it's it's it even less be, more unpredictable it might be sentient i i wonder if the directions are change and they plot it and they see it's going to starfleet headquarters not that after would, admiral vance no that would be really wild i have to say that i have to give it a nine as well and for the same reasons why both number one and, and heather brought up is that dealing with post Post-traumatic stress disorder and mental anguish, as well as the hats off to Sojourner for both the probe and for Sojourner Truth. I thought those were all really good touches. I, I really fully enjoyed this this episode. Really looking forward to the next one, whose title is Choose to Live. Okay, good. Because by answering that, you did choose to live. So next week's, that's going to be it. Remember, if you're going to be in the Los Angeles area and you're going to go to the convention, come look for us. Mention that you listen to this podcast. You will get a special token. There's going to be a plenty of stuff that's going to be run by the USS Artemis up there, um, run by Admiral Philip Watermer. And also you get the USS Navarus. Part of the 1701st will be up there as well. And you'll see Patrick in his full regalia at the table. And we'll have have stuff and it will be there so please come by and and watch uh let's see if there's anything else i forgot i already did i'll make sure that our our patreon people are aware oh last part didn't do that i know chief always has one you discovered anything new chief to listen to right lately yeah if not that's cool i can't think of anything at the top all of right my head. that's all right that's i mean there fine. was a beautiful documentary on the beatles that it just started but uh, i haven't watched that yet i saw it popped up on the thing there's there's I, three parts to it and i'm like the first part was big enough all right <laughs> that's what she said okay uh, thanks everybody for joining us make sure that you be careful out there uh, come find us listen to us through all of our different social media we're on starfleetunderground.com as well as on soundcloud itunes you can find us on youtube just about everywhere so remember if you're not a cheap bastard please go ahead and join us on our patreon so this way we can keep feeding and neutering the tribbles as you see it made a direct impact on the future because one of them are now a starfleet officer so thank you for joining us make sure that you just don't have a great week but make it so and if you can, support the show by going to patreon.com slash Starfleet Underground. Lots of perks to choose from, and you might even like some of them. Starfleet Underground, beaming into a podcast feed near you. 
Lock on to our website at starfleetunderground.com and send your comments and questions to the collective at starfleetunderground.com. Follow us on Twitter at Starfleet Under G and on Facebook and Instagram, we're Starfleet Underground.